portion of this teaching that I've been doing about sin. I know it's everybody's favorite topic. You know, how many of you are excited when you hear the preacher say, let's talk about sin? It, you know, it, it, it can be awkward to talk about sin because, the, you know, none of us really like to talk about our own sin. We're happy to talk about someone else's sin. Like, the, you know, the sin of Hollywood is easy to talk about. The sin of, you know, Washington, D.C. is easy to talk about. But the sin of 75116 or 75137 or 75233 or, you know, wherever your zip code may be is a little bit more awkward to talk about. It's even more awkward to talk about when it's, it's like, you know, not just the sin of your neighborhood, but it's your personal sin. This morning I, when I was shaving, I've gotten in the habit of, of shaving before I take the shower rather than after I take the shower. And the reason is because I hate waiting for the, the mirror to, to uh, you know, defrog or whatever you call that. I want to call it defrost, right? But that's not really what's going on there. But I, I, I'm impatient and I hate waiting for that to occur. And so, so I, I've changed my habit and I'm shaving beforehand and, and then I get in the shower. And then it dawned on me this morning, why don't I shave when I'm in the shower? Yeah, why not just shave while I'm in the shower? Because it would require a mirror. And I don't want that in there with me. If you know what I mean, right? <laughs> You know, you know what I'm saying there? I mean, it's like, it's like I really don't want the mirror in there with me because then, then I see that, you know, the, the rubble right there. And it's just like, ah, I got to wear jackets to cover that stuff up. Or, you know, all these different awkwardnesses of it. And, and when it comes to sin, the problem that we have with sin is that, well, it's awkward. And we oftentimes are ashamed of our sin. And so we're slow to talk about it. We are embarrassed at the fact that we did that. And some of you are like, well, I'm really not embarrassed. I should be because of what I did. But you know, let me just say that there's something about shame that is paralyzing in the sense that we don't talk about it. And we're not sure what to do about it. When we goof or we mess up or we sin, we're not really sure what to do about it. It's kind of like, well, yeah, I made a mess and uh, it should get cleaned up. But you know what? I'm just going to pretend that I vomited at a public restaurant and I'm going to move on and leave it for somebody else to clean up. Now, if you've ever worked in a public place where you had to clean up somebody else's vomit or bodily fluids, right, you know that's not pleasant. What's even worse is when you find it by surprise. When the person doesn't fess up. I remember a few years ago we were going into a pizza joint and, and uh, we had a teenager with us who had eaten too much that day and got a little heat sensitive and all those sort of things. And so as we're going in, he just spews right over the sidewalk. Right, right, right there in front of the entrance. Just, I won't make the sound, but you know what I mean. All right, no, that wasn't the sound. That was the, that was the, the effect, all right? Come on, sound effect guy. That was, <laughs> all right, all right. But it, it was one of those things where I was just like, great, what do we do with that, you know? And, and when you're outdoors and all that, you can just kind of, pretend that it didn't happen. You can go inside and, and cause the rest of us were still hungry and, uh, you know, we can go, <laughs> right. But it's a mess. And so, so I had to go inside and, and, and say, Hey, do you have a bucket of water? Right. And they're like, for what? I said, well, the guy with me just vomited all over the sidewalk. And they're like, okay, what do you want the bucket of water? Because I figured I'd like at least get it off the sidewalk and try and dilute it or whatever. And, but it was a mess. We had to clean up and it took a while to clean up and people were walking into the restaurant and I'm like, hi, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pouring more water down, hi. Yeah, and they're like, you know, making their big wide sweep around as they're trying to get through. You know, and that's what sin is. Sin is a big old mess that most of the time we don't know what to do with and we're awkward about it. And, and a lot of times it's someone else who has to clean up the mess, which makes it even more complicated. But there's something about our sin that, you know, it, it, not only is it messy and awkward, but it also tricks us. Have you ever noticed how sin tricks you into believing that you can clean up your own mess? I mean, think about that for just a moment. You know, he's like, well, I blew it. I messed up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean it up. I wish that, I, I wish that, you know, when that was the case. I wish that we were capable of really cleaning up our own mess. But, you know, just like when we're sick and we vomit all over the sidewalk, usually you're too sick to clean up your own mess. You need somebody else to come in and help. Are you with me? All right. For those of you who are parents in here, you know that, that 1 a.m. is the worst time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when 1 a.m. when one of your kids is sick, you're just like, 
I really just want to go back to bed, and can't the kid clean themselves up? And, and, and you know the answer to everything is no. No, they can't clean themselves up. No, this isn't going to be easy. And no, you're not getting back to sleep anytime soon because when you lay back down after it's all over, you're going to have the listening ear for when it happens again. And it's, it's horrible. But, but there's something about, the, you know, when we mess up, when we sin, that we think we can clean it up ourselves. But we can't. And, it's, and that's where we have to be aware that this is a huge problem. You know, we try and clean it up by creating self-discipline. I'll put filters on my internet provider, and I will not go to these locations, and, and we'll put in these safety measures, and, and we'll put in these rules that we're supposed to follow to keep ourselves in check. But that doesn't clean up the sin. All it does is impede us from doing it again. Are you with me? It doesn't fix the problem. All it does is slow us down. All it does is just give us one more hurdle to overcome. Because if, if you put in the safety measure, then you know how to get around it. It's kind of like, you know, when you're dieting and you give yourself a cheat day. And then you're like, you know what, I think I'm going to go ahead and give myself a second cheat day. Yeah, I'll feel a little bit of pain about it. But you know what's interesting is that you don't lose the weight. And so the problem that you were seeking to resolve by your diet didn't get fixed because you knew how to get around the problem that you were trying to clean up. And you just compound it, and you make it worse and make it more difficult. You know, we're busy trying to save ourselves. And even churchgoers are busy trying to save themselves because somehow or another we got in our head that if I do right, then God loves me more. Somehow we got it in our head that if I abstain from all the negative over here, then God loves me more. God doesn't love you anymore because you don't do something or because you do engage in something. God's love for you is a blank check. It's open all the time. God's love for you is immense and God's love for you is free of charge. You see, we talk about grace and how we can't earn our own salvation, but we, we, we fall into the trap of believing, well, I can't earn my salvation, but it's my responsibility to keep my salvation. It's my responsibility to, to make sure that I don't do anything to blow my salvation. Well, if you didn't earn it, how can you blow it? Sit on that for just a moment. If you didn't earn your salvation, it's a free gift to you. How can you blow it? I want you to think about this for just a minute. This is gonna, this is gonna I think, be uncomfortable for some of us. And I think it's gonna be uncomfortable for some of us because we've been trying to do the right thing as a way of continuing to earn a gift that was given to us. Now, what, now I wanna make sure that I'm clear on this. I am not promoting go out there and just do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. I am not promoting get engaged in behavior that you know God told you to stay away from. What I'm saying, though, is check your motivation. Check your heart on this. You see, because we get upset at everybody else's sin and oftentimes forget to look at our own sin, and we think that we can save ourselves by our own ability, but we can't. You see, as a matter of fact, when we start making a list of laws and rules that we're going to follow, we uh, actually create our own parameters of salvation. If you have your Bibles, open up to Galatians chapter 5. I want to lift up this verse for you here, which is going to be in connection to a larger section of the letter. Paul's writing to a church, and this is one of the earliest writings that we have in, in the New Testament. And when I mean earliest writings in the New Testament, what I mean is that this letter to the church at Galatia is one of the first letters that Paul wrote, and it's one of the first letters that got circulated. And it didn't just go to one church, it went to a region, it went to an area. And it circulated around. And this area had some major issues going on. You see, you have to understand that the reason that this upsets Paul so much is that the issues that they have going on go back to the issues that Paul had to deal with in his own life. Paul grew up following the rules. Paul grew up adhering tightly to the religious establishment. 
As a matter of fact, Paul describes himself as a Jew among the Jews. The, I mean, he describes himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. He is the top level of I follow the rules. And in a letter to another church, he writes, he says, I, I followed the rules so much that when someone decided that, oh, wait, we were going to grow beyond these rules, I went and I persecuted them personally, threw them in jail, had, to, had, had you know, place at the table where they were stoning the man who was telling us that there was a different way. And so here's what's happening. In this region where the church is forming in the early church era, somewhere around 15 years or so after Jesus' resurrection. The church is caught up in believing that they have to do all of the rules of what we call the Old Testament. They got to eat certain things and not eat other things. They have to make sure that the, that the men are circumcised, no matter what age. If they're going to come into you know, following after God, then they've got to get circumcised. They've got you know, these festivities that they have to participate in, these religious ceremonies at certain times of the year and certain times of the month, and, and on and on and on. And they created this list, and basically they were holding each other accountable to the list, and they said, well, you didn't observe the new moon. You didn't observe the Sabbath property. You're not circumcised. How do they know that? Because well, they had public bathhouses, right? You know, they, they had, you're eating, the, you know, shrimp and bacon, right? I mean, they had all of these rules that they were going through, check, 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 check. And so they were getting angry with each other for the fact that there wasn't harmony and everybody wasn't following the rules. And some were going around saying, look, the rules don't matter like that anymore. They're not, they're not what saves us. And the other guy's going, no, 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 you don't understand. If you don't follow this rule, you're not saved. If the basis of Christianity is grace, God's love extended to us, when we don't deserve it, how can we keep or earn our salvation by following a set of rules? So Paul writes, and this is just one that just, like, when I read it for the first time, I remember going, what? All right, so Galatians chapter 5. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and you don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. Now listen to this. This is where it really gets challenging. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Are, are, are you tracking that with me? Because like in the 80s when all the TV preachers are sinning, all right, and they're all getting called out, you know, and they're like, uh, you know, news expos and Dateline before Dateline was there, 60 minutes to run all the stories. All right, what is it that happened to those preachers? They all fell from grace, right? They all fell from grace, but that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying that when you choose to live by the law or you choose to live by your own means of keeping yourself right, that's when you have fallen from grace. That's when you are cut off from grace. That's the problem, and that's why many people struggle to try and understand what we're supposed to do after we receive grace and after we accept what Jesus has called us into. Because it's like, wait, do I have to follow these rules? No, it's not about following the rules. It's about following Jesus. And it's about his compelling love that draws us out of the sin and into life. And, and we get so caught up in it and, and that fear uh, of, of the fact that we broke a rule or we didn't quite live up to the target or, or meet the mark completely, that fear paralyzes us. And, and the reason that we don't confess our sin like we should, the reason we don't call it out like we should, is that we are afraid that if God finds out that we sinned, he's going to cut us off. Are you with me? I mean, think about it like this. How many of you broke that dish when you were growing up that was really special to mom? You know, we, we had a candy dish at, at our house, and, and it was glass, 
and we didn't really keep candy in it, I, so I didn't really know it was a candy dish until later in life. But, you know, we had the candy, and, and on top of the candy dish was the lid, and on the lid was this, this glass, you know, a butterfly, all right? Now, my mom was young, and my stepmom was young when she inherited a 10-year-old and a, 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 a 7, 8-year-old, all right? Um, but she's brave at the same time, and, and uh, she didn't realize glass and two boys um, doesn't always make for a great combination. And my brother and I were doing something. I think we were running around in the area of the living room where this glass bowl was, and uh-oh, the lid fell off, and it, it was the wing broke off of one of the of the butterfly. One of the wings broke off, and it was just like, how do we fix this? Hey, ha ha! How do we? How do we? So you know what we tried to do, right? We tried to hide it, right? Yeah, we, didn't, we didn't try and fix it. We couldn't figure out how to glue, super glue onto to, uh, to glass. We weren't sure that was going to work. So we just thought, you know what, we'll put it somewhere else. We'll hide it away and we won't fix it because we're afraid that if mom finds out that we broke the butterfly on the dish, then mom is going to kill us. Right. Remarkably, I'm still alive. Apparently, my fear of being killed didn't come to pass because though my mom was disappointed and though my mom may have been upset when she found out about it, she let me live because she loves me. Because she loves me. And we are in that position of finding ourselves afraid to honestly speak to God about the sin that's in our life and the help that we need from him to clean it up. We're afraid to speak to him because we're afraid if we speak the fact that we are sinning or have sinned, that he will have nothing to do with us. That he's done with us. And that desire to hide our sin and the desire to fix the problem ourselves by Following obediently a set of rules over here is separating us from knowing God. It's separating us from drawing close to God. It's keeping us from experiencing the love that he has for us because we're hiding from it. You see, the great dilemma that you and I have is that we are 21st century Americans. And as 21st century Americans, and, and maybe some of you aren't Americans, maybe some of you are just living here within America, so that puts you kind of in that same category. But here we have great luxury, and we lift up independence and self-reliance and all of these different dynamics that actually put us in our behaviors against what it is that God has for us. We're told, raise yourself up by your own bootstraps, which, by the way, is a huge myth. There's no one who's successful who did it all on their own. Because if you're selling a product, what do you need? Customers. You need somebody to buy your product. So you didn't do it on your own. If you're, there, there's nothing that occurs on our own. It's a myth. And we need to debunk it. And our salvation is not something we earn. It's not something that we grasp and hold on to. It's something that's given to us. And so what we need to do is we need to give in to Jesus. Paul writes this way, you know, the, the significance of this in, in Romans chapter 8. So over in Romans chapter 8, you know, we, we, we tend to think that our sin will keep us from God. We tend to think that, that the hardships that we're going through keep us from God. But re-look at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean we no longer, uh, that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Let me just tell you, those circumstances are times when we probably are tempted greatly to sin. Because if you're hungry, what are you tempted to do? Steal bread. If you're being persecuted, what are you tempted to do? Lie. Be prideful. If, if you're threatened, what are you tempted to do? Fight back, potentially murder. But these circumstances, these situations, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we're going through that? No. 
Look on to 38. It says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither fears nor, or of today or tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's what we need to understand. There's nothing that can keep us in a position where God can't love us. There's nothing that we can do that would put God in a position of going, you know, I just don't love that person anymore. Matter of fact, it kind of works the other way around. When he sees us as his wayward children running off, doing our own things, trying to fix the problems ourselves, or just ignoring him all the more, his heart breaks because he loves us so much. His heart breaks because he loves us so much. Does that mean that everybody's saved? Does that mean that everybody's getting a free pass into heaven? See, that's the, that's the, the, the quandary that we all get stuck on. And it's like, oh, wait, if, if God loves everybody, does everybody get in there? Look, I'm not God, and I can't tell you who's getting in. I can't tell you how it all works exactly. But here's what I can tell you. If you got an iPhone, you guys all had an opportunity to do an update if you have a more recent iPhone. How many of you get, got that notification that it's time for an update on your iPhone? All right. Did you know that you can choose to receive the update or ignore the update? And if you ignore the update, you know what you miss out on? All the cool new stuff. All right. You miss out on all the cool graphic. You miss out on, on, on the way that it runs faster or the way it runs slower, whatever it is that they designed it to do. <laughs> You miss out on all of that because you ignore the update. Does that mean that Apple doesn't want you to have the update? Does that mean that Apple's not interested in you, you know, stepping up it? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you've chosen to not receive it. And Jesus extends and offers to all of humanity his salvation. But some choose not to receive it. Some aren't fully made aware of what it is. That's why the church is here. And some, they receive it and don't like it and switch. I'm not sure if that's an amen <laughs> or if that's watch out, roof's about to fall. All right? But listen. We got all caught up, you know, I remember when I first came to come to know faith, and, and there was all these arguments about whether or not somebody was always saved if they'd been saved, or if you could reject your salvation or lose your salvation, you know, or if, you, if any time you sinned that you needed to get re-saved, all these different dynamics that were at play, and, and here's, the, here's what I've, I've come down to is I've studied the scripture. I don't think you lose your salvation by cussing. I don't think you lose your salvation by adultery. I don't think you lose your salvation by murder. I don't think you lose your salvation. I think the only way that you get in a position where your salvation is in jeopardy is when you reject and you switch to another system. Are you with me? And so when Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, the churches in Galatia, what he's saying to them is he's saying that, hey, when you choose to follow the law of Judaism over the grace that God has for you, you've switched. And so you're cut off. You're cut off from grace. You're cut off from the Holy Spirit. You've decided that the way you're going to be saved is through your checklist and not through a gift. And so that puts us in a very difficult position because we really then have to decide what does that mean for us today? I mean, really, how does that fit in for you and for me? Well, I want you just to pause for just a minute. I want you to try and think of what your last sin was and when you did it. All right, everybody got it? Anybody want to tell me what it is right now? No, I'm just teasing. All right, I won't make you do that. But I want you to think about that last sin and I want you to think how you tried to clean it up. On your own. Now, last week, Joel was here talking about our responsibility to clean up our mess, and that is going back around and apologizing, going back around and making sure that we make amends. But I want you to think about you know, the, the motivation behind why you tried to clean up your mess. Was it because you wanted to look good? Because you wanted to be the perfect little Christian? 
or the perfect big Christian? If you were trying to model the right way of doing things, but really in your heart it was just that you, know, you were trying to make yourself look better, trying to save yourself before God. God, I don't want you to get angry at me, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to talk to this person and, and I'm going to clean it up. But the truth is, I'm just afraid of you and I'm afraid you're going to hurt me. I'm afraid I'm going to lose something with you. You see, I think we can struggle with our sin and we believe that we can fix it on our own. And as a result of believing we can fix ourselves and fix our sin on our own in our independent culture, in our bootstrap culture that we live in, we risk cutting ourselves off from Christ. The place that we should go with our sin is to Christ, not away. It's to Christ, not away. You know, this weekend is, uh, you probably have heard something on the news or some medium about, you know, this being the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther presenting to the church of his day and age his 95 theses of his frustration, his place where he felt the church was out of alignment with the teachings of Scripture. Big day in church history. Big day. It's, it's significant. It reminded us that we are not saved by our own efforts of purchasing our freedom. But we are saved through grace by faith alone. Which is in effect saying, you know, oh wait, you know, it's not about me. It's about what he's given to me. And I choose to receive what he has given to me. I open myself up. I accept it. And, and I didn't earn it. And I, oh, and I unwrapped the gift that was presented to me. I mean, have you ever gotten a birthday present or a Christmas present that you left in the wrapping paper? How many of you have done that? That's what I thought. We all wait to at least unwrap it. And then we decide whether or not we want it. You know, if we don't want it, we take it back to the store. We say, you know, that was really nice of them to give it to me. Let's see, next year's white elephant party. There we go. Check. All right, this is the gift I'm going to re-gift. All right? We, we do all sorts of things like that. But, but, you know, here's the thing. With Christ, he's extending to you the offer to be saved. He's extending to the offer to, to be freed from your sin, to be cleansed from your sin. But we're too busy trying to figure out how to protect ourselves from the sin that's in the world. When, what he's saying is, no, I'll protect you. I'll justify you. I'll redeem you. I'll restore you. It's not what you do, it's what I do, and it's your response to me. Because I command you to go and love others just as I have loved you. That means Jesus did it first. So Martin Luther, you know, reminded the church of grace. And he's, he's kind of famous for, you know, that action, but he also, you know, he, he helped, you know, pen a song that a lot of people grew up singing, but it's based in the Psalms, right? How many of you have ever sung this, the, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God? Yeah, most of you have grown up in a church have sung that. So open up your Bibles to Psalm 46. That's what it's based in. And I want you to think about this as it relates to what we've been talking about, the ability to save yourself, the ability to make your own self right. I could sing A Mighty Fortress, but you wouldn't like it. And I don't have the other harmony parts that I did with choir. Yeah, that's it, right there, yeah. All right, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam and let the mountains tremble, tremble and the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed for a very break of day. God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and the kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious work of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes the wars to end through the earth, and he breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored in every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is 
here among us, the God of Israel is our fortress. Did you catch the word fortress and refuge that's in there? It's the same word. It's just translated a little bit different. But here's what I want you to catch, is that this is the place that you run into when you're in trouble. This is the place that you go into when things are not good. This is the place that you go into when it's bigger than you. And let me just remind you that your sin is bigger than you, so you need to run into the fortress that God is. You need to run into the refuge that Christ is, and you need to understand that he's the one. He's the one who makes it right. He's the one who protects you. He's the one who fixes it. Today we were hoping to be able to do a baptism and unfortunately the person had something come up and we're not able to, to celebrate in baptism with them today, but we're rescheduling. But I want you to think about this. As I was sharing with this person about the, the opportunity for baptism, we were going through how uh, Paul writes to, the, to church in a couple of different places, Rome uh, and, and the Colossians and, and a couple other places that, that when we are baptized, we are buried buried. And, and I was explaining that the death to self aspect of being buried. And then I was talking about coming up out of the water and the resurrection that occurs coming up out of the water and, and how that's the new life that's empowered by Christ. And so that's why baptism, that's why we practice it in, in a full immersion way. And that's the, 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 the imagery we want people to see out in the audience is also what we want you to feel as you go through it. And I was talking to them and I, and I just went on and I said, I said, you know, as, as you're being baptized, you don't lower yourself into the water. I mean, I remember the first ba big baptism that I did at, uh, in Odessa, Texas. I, I had a guy, he was like close to 300 pounds. And at the time, I was 135 pounds. And I was, I was sitting there thinking, I don't know how it's going to work, right? I mean, he was a big dude. He's a big dude. I, I'm sitting there going, you know, I know water helps with it all and everything, but, but I'm not sure. And so I asked a guy, hey, you know, one of the other guys in the church, one of the, the uh, board members, I said, hey, would you come in with me? Because I'm afraid that, that I won't be able to get him up. Right? I think I can knock him down. I mean, I think I can knock Goliath down. Getting Goliath back up is a whole different story. But, you know, so, 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 so it was, it was, I was going to lower him in, but... If you've never had the opportunity to baptize someone else, let me just tell you that the work, that there's a little bit of work of, of putting them in, but they've got to be willing to go down, right? They willingly die. So it's the dying to self. It's, it's the fall backwards that they do, and they're trusting that, you know, there's the water behind them and that you're going to guide them and all those sort of things. But if you've ever stood and looked at someone who's being baptized while you're baptizing them, right, there is this instant, this momentary, mo just like a, a splinter of a second of, of oh my goodness, I'm underwater. Who, how am I going to get out of here? There is a panic that comes over. That's why some people are like, I am not doing baptism because you are not going to put me in the water and then I can't get up. Let me just tell you, that's why it's important important that you experience baptism because if you go into the water you need help getting up you can't save yourself once you're dead Jesus is the one who saves you and so the reason that someone else baptizes you and the reason that someone else is there and you don't baptize yourself is because that person is representing Jesus who's leading you to the place of death and lifting you up into life and let me just tell you church that's why it's important that we understand that we go to Jesus with all of our sin because he's going to be the one who lifts us up he's going to be the one who enlivens us and if we don't get that then we have a dead faith and we will continue to try and save ourselves and we will be cut off Amen. we'll be cut off and so that's why I love baptism I get to stand there and I get to watch people go down and they, they willingly go down and let me just tell you they, they're anxious to get up I've not dropped anyone yet I've held a few down a little longer I did. I did. Not just here. You think I held you down a long time? No, yours went long. <laughs> I had this guy, he was, he was about my age, and, and, and he was like, I, I've done a lot of sin. And I said, well, don't worry. The deeper the sin, the deeper the plunge, right? <laughs> so we were in his in-law's swimming pool, and I held him down. And then I pulled him up. You know what? It's not comfortable. 
to go to Jesus with our sin. But if we go to Jesus with our sin, he doesn't love us less. He still loves us. And so when he layers, lowers us down into that place of death, he's raising us as well. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and they're going to lead us in a few songs, and, and uh, we're going to get a time to respond here. But here's what I want you to think about. Are you busy trying to save yourself? I want you to to wrestle with this idea that, that, that the psalmist writes about and that God is my refuge, my fortress. I run into him. He's the one who protects me. Maybe this week you're going to take some time and you're going to read through Psalm 46 and you're going to find a few other psalms that mention the word refuge. And you're going to dwell on that. You see, the psalmists aren't big on theology. They're big on experience. They're big on talking about their experience and, the, and they found that God was safe. They found that God was a protector. They found that God loved. And maybe this week you need to remind yourself by reading the words that God put down for you. And you just need to pause and just go, you know what? I need to look at this idea of refuge. I need to look at this idea of fortress. I need to look at this idea that it's Jesus who saves, not me. It doesn't matter how good I am. Because, I mean, look, if you were to take all of my moral failures in life, it's really not a big list. It's a small list. Not counting my pride. But it's not really, I mean, I don't have a lot of bad things that I've done. But that doesn't, that doesn't save me. It's Jesus who saves me. It's his grace. And I choose to receive it. I'm open to it. So this week, maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe, maybe here today, right now, what you need to do is, is you just need to, you know, put yourself in a position, a physical position that reminds you, that reminds you that it's not about you. And sometimes that position is on your knees. So maybe you want to come front and you just want to bow at one of these altars and just bend down and actually put yourself in that position to go, you know what? I submit. I give in to Jesus. Maybe somebody in this room today, and I'm not trying to stoke your emotions or anything like that. I just, I, I just, I, I want to extend the opportunity. You see, I knew the person wasn't going to be able to be baptized Friday because it's something that came up. But I went ahead and filled the tank. I went ahead and filled the tank because there's just this stirring, this sense in which I think, I mean, I love when people can invite all their family and friends to baptism because I like a bigger crowd. But I also think there's a side to what happened in Acts when Philip is running alongside the treasurer of Ethiopia. And the guy's having the scripture explained to him. The treasurer of Ethiopia is having the, the scriptures explained to him and, and, and Jesus explained to him and how Jesus saves and how he has to you know, submit to Jesus. And, and, and as they're moving along, they look and they see a pool of water out there and the, and the Ethiopian looks at, at Philip and says, hey, there's some water right there. Can I just go ahead and do it now? Yeah. You see, if you're in that spot where you just need to, you need to fully embrace the salvation of Jesus and follow through with, you know what, I'm committing to this and I'm, I, I, I'm going to demonstrate it not only to the people around, but I'm, I'm going to physically remind myself of that moment through baptism. Guess what? We don't have a change of clothes for you. We got a heated building. We got a full tank. And so if that's you today, you want to you take that step, then just come on through these doors over here on, on the left, my left, your right, and I'll be waiting there for you. I'll change clothes, or maybe I'll just go like this, just to join you. But there's no shame in not being ready for salvation. There's no shame in surrendering. So as the team plays, and, and I want you to, to, to join into worship. I want you to receive the gift that God has for you. I want you to recognize it's not about you. It's about his love for you. And I want you to come and just receive the fountain that he has, the blessing that he has for you. God, we bow our heads right now. 
And today we acknowledge that we have a tendency to want to save ourselves. I acknowledge that I have a tendency to want to save myself. And I need your salvation in my life. I need you to clean up my mess. I need you to protect. I need you to be the fortress around me. So God, would you stir in us and would you move in us this way today? In Jesus' name, amen.